My name is Amanda Peterson. I'm on the product marketing team here at Ardent Mills, and I'm happy to be your host today. A little background on Ardent Mills. We are the North America's leading flower supplier and grain innovator. Our operations and services are supported by more than 35 flour mills, a specialty bakery, a gluten-free facility, and the Annex by Ardent Mills, a dedicated team committed to cultivating the future of specialty grains and plant-based ingredients. As the company's mission is to enhance the quality of life and standard of health, our bold spirit of innovation and, and imagination has allowed us to approach our operations and partnerships differently, bringing innovative thinking to everything we do. This is why our company has acquired Andean Naturals, the leading supplier of quinoa in North America. And we've also made public our intentions to acquire Henrik's Trading Company, one of the leading suppliers and growers of chickpea in the United States. This presentation is a window into our passion for nourishing what's next sustainability in our way to reach out to the food industry to let you know that you can count on us to be your supply partner as you look to source quinoa. Today, we have two speakers. You can see them right there on their video, Sergio and Vikram. Um, I will introduce Sergio, who was born and raised in Bolivia, which is one of the main quinoa producing regions. Uh, he is our quinoa line expert and lead. Uh, as a founding partner of Andean Naturals 16 years ago, he has seen quinoa go from rags to riches, as he says. He will share a bit of his story and the path forward he sees for quinoa as it becomes an everyday food. He also shares passion to why this is even a worthy pursuit for us in the industry. Also on the panel, we have Vikram Ghosh. He has a strong background in both food science, a PhD from Penn State and a master's in business. With over 18 years working in both R&D and sales, he understands the difficulties both departments face to launch new products and innovate. We brought Vikram on to answer the most difficult questions we can throw at him, an effort to address the possible hurdles that the industry needs to overcome as it brings quinoa and other grains and seeds to market. Quinoa has come a long way from a food grown in the Andes by smallholder farm farmers to a widely available ingredient. How did quinoa get here and where is it going to next? And I will now turn it over to one of our speakers, Sergio. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I hope you guys can hear me well. Um, of course, I'm, I'm passionate about bringing the message of quinoa to the world. Uh, um, actually, you can go back to the, the prior slide before we get to the United Nations. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself really quickly. Uh, I was born in Bolivia, which is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And it's also the second largest uh, producer of quinoa after Peru. Um, interestingly, when I grew up there, it wasn't consumed much in the cities. Um, so we'd rarely have it at home. Um, it was mainly the food of the poorest, those who lived in um, highland deserts near the salt flats. And their land is so poor in nutrients. Um, saline, there's no access to irrigation, and it's really the only cash crop that they can produce and survive on. Uh, so my professional career took me from working initially for the United Nations to nonprofits to finally founding um, Benefit Corporation, is I wanted to see if we could use the power of business to bring about social change and poverty alleviation, and found, hey, quinoa might be just a perfect tool for it. So go ahead now to the flag. Um, that's the United Nations flag. And that's a flag that we saw in 2013 over the building, the, the headquarters in New York, uh, where a full day was devoted to talking about quinoa. And you had world leaders there uh, bringing the world's attention to this almost forgotten grain, uh, saying, well, this is uh, the legacy of over 3,000 years of dedicated breeding by South American indigenous farmers. And uh, the Secretary General said, hey, quinoa is a tool to eradicate poverty, um, provide food security and boost nutrition. And not just in Bolivia or in its native countries, but everywhere in the world. So that was the, the, the calling for quinoa that um, the world leaders um, provided. And um, I'll go over to the next slide about how it helped alleviate poverty and then provide sustainable production, building, uh, bringing about the, the food security part, but then how we still are falling short of that last part, which is to make it an everyday food 
boosting nutrition for everyone. So back to this slide, um, this slide highlights a couple points. So first off, you can notice in the photos, these are smaller farmers. They have 10, 20 acres per household. And they're located at 12,000 feet of altitude in a highland plateau. And it interestingly takes about two years worth of rain to get one crop. And um, you can see how dry it is on the photo. They're hand harvesting there. There's desert-like conditions. And um, you can see their, uh, their mud hut. It's a picture taken about uh, 10 years ago. And then you can see how now their house has a tin roof and, and brick, uh, bricks. Um, and uh, this was a, a success story that we've seen. We've seen their incomes, like you can see on the bottom right, go from $35 a month to $350 a month. And really showing that these smaller farmers can be players in a globalized um, industrial food supply chain. So these farmers on the top right, for example, are Costco suppliers. And Costco is one of the highest, um, uh, is, is very high demanding in volumes, quality, reliability of supply. So this was really a dream come true for us as a benefit corporation, including hundreds of smaller farmers in the uh, world supply chain and seeing, seeing them rise out of poverty. So with this, we really saw that quinoa had the potential to accomplish that first of its calling to um, eradicate poverty. Go ahead to the next slide. On this one, we can um, we start delving into the food security part. So here, even in the very poor soils, we saw um, yields varying from when the farmers uh, didn't use any fertilizer to the more traditional rotations uh, where uh, farmers would use llama dung. And we're talking rotations are three year rotations. And then we saw some of our farmers that were the more traditional ones and they made a compost. And the compost um, had uh, uh, like a, a yogurt type uh, fermented milk added to it. It even has some, uh, some urine, some molasses, and they let it just uh, rest for a while. And then they add that. And you can see the incredible um, returns they're getting on, on this compost. So, so we, we saw this, these uh, star farmers um, really break out of the bunch and learn, we, we learned from them um, what their secret was. And it really came down to nourishing the soil microflora. So with, um, with a very healthy soil, the minerals and nutrients are more available to the plants and they would grow stronger and produce more seed. So we saw that even in poor marginal soils, we could um, get really good quantities of healthy foods. Um, go ahead to the next one. Um, this one shows that the impact can not only, can be uh, not only in the Andes, but also we see it here in Colorado where the impact on water savings is tremendous. So you can see uh, in, in Bolivia, quinoa will grow with natural rainfall, only 12 inches of rain per year. And here we're again seeing that 12 inches of, um, you can see it on the left, of, uh, of water needs compared to some of the other rotational crops. So for these farmers, um, for every thousand acres, you can see 555, so yeah, 555 Olympic sized pools worth of water they're saving. So for a farmer, that puts it into a uh, pretty good perspective. Now, if you're a, a consumer that, that um, it, what's, what's easier to think about is that for every pound that a consumer buys, about 300 gallons of water are saved. Are, are saved meaning not taken up for irrigation and can be used for uh, other purposes. Um, just as a, uh, as a figure, each American household on average uses about 300 gallons of water per day. So one quinoa is equivalent to the water usage per day. So tremendous water savings there. Um, so you can see, yes, quinoa is not only a uh, good sustain, uh, on the sustainability part with water savings, but also it contributes to soil health as a rotational crop. 
breaks disease cycles and improves the soil health. Go ahead to the next one. So this one, I'll go quickly through this one. Um, the point here is quinoa is a very efficient way of producing food per acre. So very efficient way of producing plant-based protein. As population grows, more pressure on available um, soils and uh, agricultural lands. Hence, we need to focus on what's the best way to, um, the best usage for, for that available land. And um, now that we've really shown the, how quinoa show can contribute to food security and poverty alleviation, let's dig into the last part which is how to make it become an everyday staple. Go ahead. So on this one, I wanna dig into the prices a little bit and really uh, vent a little bit of my frustration that I've seen in the past couple of years with how slowly the market for quinoa is growing. Um, so first let's, let's see the prices. So initially the discovery phase, nobody really knows much about quinoa. It's difficult to find unknown and most of it, when you find it, it's dirty and bitter, which is strange because uh, before Columbus arrived to the Americas, quinoa was a staple here, uh, along with potatoes and corn. There was no rice or wheat in this continent. So um, in 2004, we started addressing the two key issues that we saw were preventing the market from growing. And um, that was quality and availability. With that, we go into a growth phase, which leads also into the valuation of quinoa. So price goes up and you start seeing it at Trader Joe's, Costco, a little bit everywhere. The spe speculation year is 2013, but also that's when, so prices spike because of the speculation, but also the world's attention turns to quinoa and quinoa starts being produced, not just by the smaller traditional farmers, but from Uganda to Holland, um, India, China, uh, pretty much everywhere now. And um, now we start seeing what we call the fractionation stage when the parts are worth more than the whole. And that's, uh, you, you can see clearly how the, the organic and the conventional prices will start spreading. And I, I know we have a few people in the industry, traders and growers and uh, it's, it's hard, of course, to bring a vision to where things are going, but my expectation is that we're going to see the organic prices stabilize at a, a sustainable rate, which is hard to determine because it depends on the farmer's uh, plot sizes and uh, their locations, but I would expect around $2,500 per metric ton and the conventional will keep dropping and dropping as um, better yields, better uh, seeds are available and farmers just get better at producing the quinoa. And that's when really the market will start opening up. Go ahead to the next slide. So when I, um, I'm running out of time on my 10 minutes, but this one is exactly what I was talking about, my frustration part. You can see how after a very fast growth, the market started um, tapering off. So this is in quantity of quinoa imported into uh, the United States. Yellow is imports and the orange is uh, domestic production. And you can see the tapering off after the speculation years in 2013-14. But now the vision is we're going to um, start hitting up another very strong growth stage, which uh, will be brought about by uh, domestic production and uh, imports from countries that are producing, uh, that are the non-traditional countries. And um, that quinoa we expect will be the quinoa that's used as an ingredient in foods that will be um, able to bring about the nutrition, um, the promise of boosting nutrition in everyday foods. Uh, go, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, these are two of our farmers. Um, they, we invited them uh, to come to the United States from Bolivia. It was their first time on an airplane. It was their first time in a supermarket like this. It was their first time uh, visiting the ocean, for example. And, um, 
And we, um, we explained to them uh, that our vision was that um, quinoa would be everywhere from soups to crackers to um, everyday foods. And uh, some would talk about the story of the farmer, whereas some would have quinoa as an ingredient. And neither of them was to be demonized, um, meaning quinoa has to be in an everyday food that's very cheap and available because you cannot hold quinoa from accomplishing its mission to nourish everyone, uh, which means not everybody can afford a $5 bag of quinoa. It also has to be in soups, it has to be in cereals and crackers and even boosting the nutrition of uh, puffed snacks. Um, I was gonna tell a funny story about uh, their noticing the nutrition facts on the label, but I'll save that for another time because I, I know my, my time ran out. Because uh, well, I know we have questions coming in, so I wanna make sure that we have uh, time for, for those, uh, Amanda. So let, let's go ahead and, and uh, turn it back to you now. Okay, you kind of teased us there, Sergio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll put it in the chat, you can tell that story or we'll, we'll get back to it. But thanks again for that overview of the market, the vision of quinoa leading the way and boosting the nutrition of everyday foods. Uh, in this slide, effectively, we do see that the trends are pointing in favor of quinoa, providing an exciting opportunity in the market for new products. So you've got, you know, which of the following sources of plant-based protein do you eat on a regular basis? And 66% of the majority of consumers already eat or would be interested in trying quinoa. I will now hand this over to Vikram, whose expertise is in product development and sales, who will help answer some of the questions that we have for him, some of the questions that we've received. Um, uh, please feel free to keep sending your questions in. Um, I, you know, in, in Zoom, we've got that Q&A button that you can add your questions in right there. So uh, we'll do our best to, to answer your questions in the allocated time, but uh, we will turn it over to Vikram. And our first one, Vikram, for you, uh, why does quinoa appeal to consumers and what claims can I make by using this product? Thanks, Amanda. I think uh, one of the things um, I'll talk about first is you mentioned about how people are wanting to uh, have uh, quinoa protein or uh, have quinoa. And also what we have seen in our market research is that quinoa ranks in the top 10 of the ingredients that are seen as most helpful. So it is with you know, your honey and eggs, uh, those type of ingredients. Um, at the same time, uh, you can have certain other uh, claims with quinoa. A, it, you can have it organic, it's non-GMO, it's gluten-free, um, it's vegan, um, whole grain, clean label, you can get free trade. Um, on top of it, I guess from a product developer standpoint, there are certain functional effects. Uh, that can help you. So uh, for example, it has a high amylopectin content. Uh, what it means is it is a type of starch uh, that helps uh, as a good binder or a thickener, and it can also uh, slow the big uh, staling in baked goods. Uh, it also uh, has uh, the starch granules, which are small in size. So it provides you with that um, thermal stability in frozen foods and emulsions. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, is not talked about, you know, you don't see in the nutritional panel is that it has uh, different uh, types of polyphenols um, uh, that is uh, inherent in quinoa. So the next question, are any questions on that? Yeah, great, thank you, Vikram. We'll jump to this next one here. Uh, what sustainability claims can one make when using quinoa? So I think uh, before the claims, I should say, you know, uh, that quinoa has always be, been a very sustainable crop. So for example, uh, you know, Sergio was mentioning about rice. Rice requires seven feet of water each year to grow. Whereas quinoa, you need only eight to 12 inches. It's a very resilient plant. It thrives where no other crop survival, which is where you see in the high altitude, uh, about 12,000 feet. Uh, in the Andes that it is uh, grown. Now from a sustainability where you can quantify it, so uh, we have uh, kind of highlighted here, out here uh, that in Colorado where we are growing this quinoa, you can save 
366 millions of uh, a million gallons of water for every uh, thousand acre planted. So that is something that you can quantify um, as you want to uh, talk about. And then uh, we presented this slide about uh, the amount of protein per acre. A uh, great thing is uh, the quinoa produces about 15 times more protein per acre than beef. Uh, on the standpoint of water, it takes a hundred times less water to produce than a pound uh, in a pound of animal protein, which is a great thing to have when you are trying to make any uh, sort of sustainable grains. Yeah, that's great. Um, I also just really quick looking at the chat here, I wanted to introduce that we've got Lori Scanlon, an R&D director here at Ardent Mills, who's going to help field some of our questions. We'll get her on, you know, maybe live after we get through some of our other questions, but that's who's going to also help us answer some questions in the chat. So wanted to quickly introduce Lori there. Um, and then this next question for you, Vikram, I want to develop a product with quinoa. However, if the sales of the product grow, how can I be assured of the growth supply with the growth of my business? That is a very legitimate question because uh, when you, you want to have that supply assurance when you're developing a product, you don't want to launch a product and suddenly middle of it, uh, you are realizing, okay, I don't have any more to right. supply my growth. Uh, and that is where, uh, you know, and here is my only sales pitch out here is Arden Mills uh, has a, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a trusted partner. That's what we say in our uh, vision statement. And uh, we have great, connection with the, the farmers in Bolivia. We have connection with the farmers in Peru. And what we can do is, as this is, goes with a dialogue, as you're developing a product, have that dialogue, then um, we can source this uh, quinoa, what is what we need is. Uh, at the same time, I guess uh, the another question is, is um, that um, in the, the US, uh, we talked about growing uh, quinoa in Colorado we can work with farmers and uh, grow more quinoa as needed so that we have different sources of supply from a supply quantity standpoint, volume standpoint, and also from a supply assurance standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great. I love that you mentioned partnership and just you know being the leaders in quinoa, we have the scale to be able to supply our, our customers. That's great. Um, another one, I've been working with quinoa for some time and there's some variability lot to lot. How can I get a consistent product? So um, I think uh, with quinoa, because you know, good and the bad side is you're getting from the smaller farms. So then you get variability from farm to farm. Um, and, but on the other hand, if, and it is, I guess, best suited for a small batch type of product or things like salad where the variability a uh, uh, lot to lot variability is not as impactful, but if you are working on a high speed line where you're trying to make uh, uh, you know, a lot of product per minute, then that uh, tight specification is important. In that situation, some of the things that we have done is a, say for example, if you're using our US grown quinoa, then that comes from a same region. So there is, much tighter specification, let lot to lot, less lot to lot variability. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you have uh, that control in the quality. Same thing with, uh, we can do, you know, if you, if you need that a lot to lot consistency, we can also make sure that the quinoa that we source from South America has that consistency for you. Mm -hmm. Great, we'll jump to this next one here. We have a lot of documentation requirements. What kind of help can I get for fulfilling documentation needs? Uh, that's uh, always the challenging one, right? Because documentation comes at the end of it and you want to literally jump in and get it done. Um, good thing is, our, you know, we have a great uh, quality team and they are very good at uh, fulfilling most, of, uh, most type of uh, documentation need. If there is a special need, um, it's it's always good to have that conversation. Then um, then we can you know make sure that we get the time uh, and fulfill the requirements that you have. Great. 
Uh, quinoa is a new ingredient for us. We don't know its versatility in our formulation. How can you help me? Yes, uh, this is, uh, I guess we have people like Laurie Scanlon that uh, Amanda talked about. Uh, she is very passionate about quinoa. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I, I, every time I talk to her, I, I get that uh, excitement. I think also with the uh, acquisition of Anya Natural, we have some of the uh, you know, robust uh, qua, uh, you know, quinoa technology R&D team um, that is there. We are looking at different uh, applications of quinoa. So from, uh, so for example, if you have a question about, you know, where is your starting point? Where do you need uh, any, um, uh, you know, any, any questions of, uh, from a formulation question from par, uh, problem solving, um, we can also help you from, from a consultative standpoint. So it can be, hey, I need a starting point or can you help me figure it out? So because we might not have answers to every questions that you have, but we can always be, again, and use the same term, the partner uh, to create the same, uh, uh, you know, create you the solution or the solution that you need. Um, and we also have done, as uh, we talked about, looked at different applications. So, um, for example, we have looked at it. Okay, if you want to use in a bread flour, you can use up to 30% of quinoa. And those things have come from our experience. Quinoa can use, uh, you know, the bullet point we have pointed out here is it can help in improving drowning in low moisture baked goods such as cookies and crackers. These are just examples. Uh, in the bake side, we can help you also in a meal side. We have uh, someone, uh, Haley Rogers, who is a great um, a culinary person who can uh, come up with uh, solutions on the meal side too for you. And, and just to follow up on one of the live questions that we've gotten on its versatility and formulation, and I might actually send this one over to Lori uh, if you are able to go on camera or be live, but we had a question of, is quinoa used or has been used for uh, plant-based milks? There you are. Hi everyone. Yes, it absolutely has been used for plant-based milks and um, is a great option by itself or with other, with the other um, uh, pseudo cereals, gluten-free grains, um, pulses in combination to make a plant-based milk. Great, and I have another one, I, maybe for, for Sergio, maybe for you, Lori. One, do we have ground quinoa? I assume mostly ground quinoa has water binding uh, capacity. Yes, um, yeah, I can, I can take that too. We, we do right. have, uh, you know, ground quinoa means we do have that quinoa flour uh, that has that uh, water binding ca ca capacity. We have looked at in beverages um, and it does absorb a good amount of water. Laurie, anything you want to add on top of that? Yes, um, quinoa not only has a higher uh, it, higher water binding capacity and adhesiveness um, compared to um, control flowers such as wheat, which we compare um, many things to. So it, it, it increases um, absorption in uh, um, your batters and doughs, which um, can be helpful depending on the application, but also it we found that it's very cohesive with doughs, such as tortillas and, and, and cookies, so. I've got one more. I know we're nearly at time here. Um, does domestic and foreign sources have the same quality, flavor, and appearance? That might be one for either Vikram or, or Sergio. So I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take one part. Uh, so the domestic that we are growing in Colorado uh, we have seen it very similar to the Bolivian quinoa uh, from a property standpoint. Uh, Sergio, anything more you want to add? Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful with uh, um, what I mentioned in my presentation about de demonizing one or the other. Like, like we have to see the quinoa as a toolbox where it's so biodiverse and uh, there's currently breeding programs that target quinoa that will be best used as a flower or quinoa that will be best used as a beverage. 
And I think that that's the tool that we have to use as we grow our programs for conventional quinoa is seeing which, where are we directing that quinoa to go to? So we have the traditional South American quinoa that's really good all around, specifically uh, has been bred for side dishes. So it's consumed mainly as a side dish and it's perfect for them. It may not be the best for extrusion though. So there's, um, there's aspects of quinoa that need to be studied where we identify, okay, these genetic traits make this quinoa better for extrusion. And therefore we can start directing our breeding programs to create a quinoa that will be directed towards that application. So that's what's cool about quinoa is that, and also cool about the time we live in, is that in the past 10 years, quinoa breeding has gone so fast and so far that you could equate it to the last 150 years in wheat breeding. So now with the tools that we have with um, uh, satellite monitoring, uh, drone technology, um, decoding the ge genetics, uh, genetic markers, we, we can uh, go much further, even with just natural breathing. Um, so, so that's where I wanna make sure that we, we look at quinoa overall as a good thing and, uh, and don't say, oh, that's bad quinoa, this is good quinoa. It's all good, it just has its specific application that we have to look at. Thank you, Sergio. Um, we are at time. I uh, wanted to thank everyone for joining this webinar. Um, I do see a few questions in here that we didn't get to, you know, Patty and Edward and a few others. Um, we will follow up and email you back and get you an answer to those questions. Um, if you want to learn more, request a sample, um, go to our quinoa page. I also put it in our chat. Um, and you can head over there. And again, thank you to our speakers, Sergio and Vikram today. Thank you for joining, engaging, and learning with us today. So. Have a nice day.